Chapter 2, The Assassins. Two dark figures crept through the thick underbrush just outside the forest town of Rouge and paused near the bars of the tall iron fence that encompassed and supposedly protected it. It was past midnight and very dark. Inside, they saw tranquil lights flickering from lamps hung on distant posts and porches. It was hot and the air was moist. Beads of water gathered and dripped down through levels of leaves to the fertile black earth. The two assassins crouched in the twisted roots of a great knotted Albanian tree to reevaluate their situation. Their names were Habad and Terzda, infamous assassins from the far off land of Persia, Prince Gabriel's own distant kingdom. They had been on the hunt for many weeks now, searching diligently for the young human boy, a novice traveler of the wilds, at first escorted by an inexperienced crew who was carrying with him a mysterious stone key of some kind that opened some old cave door for some stone or something. They did not know the boy's name or where he was from or truly what the stone key unlocked. Those things did not concern Habad and Terzda. They were motivated only by gold and reputation, not politics, and the Garnian generals who hired them for this particular job were offering them an abundance of both upon their successful return. The killing of the boy, as far as the Garnians were concerned, was of no consequence. That was to be the assassin's prerogative when the time came. The Garnians only wanted the key, whatever symbolism it was, stood for. Since that time, Habat and Terza had found the boy and somehow lost him again. Now, with Gabriel in the picture, matters had complicated exponentially. Habat signaled for them to move closer to the gates with a subtle hand gesture. He was thin, quick, and cautious now nearly 70 years old, but calculatingly deadly. Terzda, on the other hand, was a mass of muscled flesh, young, large, and big-boned, slower but very strong. He was just as deadly, but his youth made him boastful and careless. Well, at times, this irritated Habat, who had agreed to become his mentor, 13 years before, only if Terzda would listen and obediently learn from him. Often Habad found himself regretting that decision. Terzda's lust for gratuitous pain and killing had almost gotten him captured on three recent occasions. Habad did not want to end up dangling <laughs> from the end of a, 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 a ranger's rope now. Uh, not at his age. Retirement was just one good paying job away. Damn it, Terzda. Tracks have stopped. They've given us the slip again, Habad said, hissing like a snake as he spoke. His eyes reflected the dim town lights like dried pools of milk. I told you they wouldn't stop here. I knew it. Gabriel knows we're hunting them. Let's move before it rains again, Terzda whispered looking towards the turbulent sky. We've wasted two days here already. I hate this jungle. Habad rubbed his nasty nose. <clears throat> Where do you think, then? Anywhere else but here. Hush, guards! The sound of muffled footsteps came from their left. The assassins became as still as shadows as two armed Derugian night guards, hired police from Tungulin, passed near them just inside the protective fence. They were lean and gaunt for men, but soft and easily broken by the experienced assassins should it come to it. The road uh, that encircled the town just inside the fence was patrolled regularly, <clears throat> although Habat and Terza could not figure out why. Except for their own presence, there was... No real danger for this quaint little mining town. 
and the iron fence adequately repelled any dangerous wildlife. There was no political significance or great hoard of wealth in De Rouge. The animal, the human animals, uh, uh, paranoia it was. They had finally decided between them. Strolling at ease, two helmeted guards entered their patrol station, a small, wide, bullet-shaped stone structure near the huge iron gate. Habet and Terzda curiously watched the guards check in while two others began their semi-punctual rounds of the De Rougian perimeter. It was shift change for the guards, which meant that, for a few minutes, the town's already slack security was even more vulnerable. When the guards had passed, Habad spoke again. Hmm, I think Gabriel will take that boy on to Tungulin, where he can get a physician. It's the only place that makes any sense. Gabriel knows the land between here and there better than most. He'll take the old paths through the Galothian forest and avoid the main roads until he gets closer to the city. That's what I'm thinking. Terzda groaned in response. I'm bored, and I'd love a flask of whiskey. I want to get this over with. The week of 11 trials begins soon in Arisia. Habad hissed at him. You're so damned impatient. You must think sometimes, you ignorant toad. Haven't you learned anything? I learned that I... Get stiff if I squat too long, my knees ache. Habad wiped his nose on his scrawny forearm. Crouching in the slime and muck, waiting, watching, and thinking comes with the job, Terzda. It's made me very rich, and you haven't done so bad yourself tagging along with me, so stop your belly aching. We should have had them by now. Hell, Habad. They're on foot. Gabriel's probably still carrying the boy. We keep falling for his damn woodsman tricks. Habad held the blood-stained dagger in the air before him and twisted it back and forth, reenacting the cruel technique he had used to inflict the boy's leg wound. At any rate, the boy should never walk again. I poked him good. We should have kept torturing him that night until he told us where the key was. We shouldn't have stopped. We shouldn't have gotten so pissed either. We mustn't... Uh, well, he must have hidden a key somewhere close by. In the woods, maybe. I do admire the little bastard for his cunning escape, though, Terzdov, lame as he was. We should have chained him up better. We'll catch him again, Habad. Yes, we will. Ha, 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 ha and we'll be far less kind the second time around. Yes, we will, Habad responded. I'll hobble the little maggot at the ankles for stealing our craft, a little scum bucket. Terzdog groaned. The sound was deep and ominous. I don't know, he said. His escape was in fate's hands, Habad. I believe that now. It's no random chance that led Prince Gabriel didn't Diane to this particular boy in this particular out-of-the-way forest. It's destiny, both his and mine. Distractions, Habad said. Don't set your mind on killing Gabriel, Terzda. That's not our job. Focus only on the key. The Ghanians are paying us for the key. And that's all. If it requires murder, then yes, so be it. They must have suspected that it might come to that. Otherwise, they could have hired a handful of trackers and, and thieves to retrieve it instead of us, renowned as we are, Habad said, smiling with a devilish pride. This key must be very important to them to be offering so much. Turstar shifted his weight from one leg to the other. His dark brown skin leather rough and hairy, was adorned with thick, crude leather straps and dirty brass circlets with spikes in the center of each, which shimmered slightly when he moved. Your motive is greed. Mine is infamy. 
coming across a prince warrior of Persia is my destiny. He groaned hungrily, eyes distant. I have no control of this, Habad. In the grand scheme, the key is incidental. This meeting is meant to be. It is villainy versus royalty. You do understand this? Habad sighed. Your thirst for infamy will be your downfall, my brother. A squeaky clattering cart came down the road and turned toward the busy town inn. The guard near the gate took a sip of tea and waved casually to the driver. They exchanged a few cordial words concerning the inclement weather. Habad and Terzda took the opportunity to skirt along the fence line and pause under the shadow of the gate wall. The gateway arch was made of huge fitted stones covered with mosses and hairy lichens. The stone foundation was old and weather-worn. The black rusty bars were as ancient, all wrought before written history of the Thorians, who were supposedly the original settlers of De Rouge. The assassins froze under the shadow of large ferns. The solemn light cast by a flickering lamp lashed at them through the leaves. A large wild cat Somewhere in the valley to the north of the city let out a long, shrill cry. The crescent-shaped blooms of the sensitive catwatcher night flowers closed at the eerie sound. Habad wiped his crusty nose on his shoulder, and then he rubbed it in with the palm of his hand. Here's the plan then, mate. We'll head north and fast. No use tracking them. Gabriel's too good a woodsman. He lost us here, he'll lose us again. We must catch them by surprise. They've got a two-day start on us. That means they'll reach Tungulan in less than two more. Well, the inn is busy tonight, so there will be plenty of skycrafts in the lot. We'll steal two. Then we'll catch up to them. We'll patrol the incoming roads to Tungulan from this direction and pay scouts to... Immediately, Habad and Terza fell silent, fading back further into the shadows. A guard had stirred and was coming toward them, beamer in one hand, keys in the other. The assassin sunk low toward the ground, eyes squinting into non-reflective slits. I thought I heard whispers again. The guard said to the other, who was sitting lazily inside the station, nose in a book. He pulled a small handheld blaster from his hip and stepped up to the fence, just feet away from Habad and Terzda, and peered out over them into the dark forest beyond. The inky blackness was total, a lightless void stretching infinitely in all directions. Only creatures with nocturnal senses far superior to those of civilized beings, wandered restlessly and silently under the cover of those dense wooded canopies. Didn't you hear that time, Lake? Now, you've been hearing things for two nights in a row, Can, the other guard replied. It's just the wind in the trees again, I'm telling you. Well, I'm going to have a look for myself this time, just to be sure. Lake looked up from his reading, peering out the window. I don't think that's a good idea, Cran, he said. Not at night. Uh, you know better than that. As Cran stepped up to the black iron gate that separated De Rouge from the savage forest, he flashed his beamer into the running shadows. The air was thick with mosquitoes, swarming right outside the gate, as though they knew, like all bad and wild creatures, that they weren't welcome inside. Fumbling with the keys, Quan unlocked the massive deadbolt and stepped out into the darkness. Lake stood. Clan, he said. It was forbidden by law for any regular De Rougian citizen to step outside the gate at night for any reason, and the Tungulinian night guards could only do so under exceptional circumstances and only with permission from one's superiors. There was an old fireside story about a foolish young De Rougian watchman who opened the gate one night for whatever reason. Some say he was lured out by a beautiful woman with 
white skin and lips the color of red roses with coal black hair. Standing alone, barely dressed, outside in the middle of the road. The next morning, many barns and sheds were found broken into, and the livestock had been drained of blood. No one had ever found any clues regarding the whereabouts of the young watchman, only the gate standing wide open the next morning. The fable was appropriately known as the Foolish Watchman. Clan, remembering the story, hurriedly locked the gate behind him, then turned and took the beamer out from under his arm, holding it up in a shaky hand. He bravely stepped off the cobblestone road into the summer weeds, moving awkwardly through the knotted undergrowth to where he thought he had heard the clandestine voices. All around him, shadows swayed in the forms of leafy boughs and groping crawlers. The moaning night wind swept upwards into the night sky, pushing the dark clouds westward, end over end. The Galothian forest at night was a murky, foggy marshland with hungry mouths hidden in quiet brambles and tangled roots. You all right? Lake called from the guardhouse, hand on the warning bell. Fine, Clan answered from the woods, his voice quivering just a little. It was uh, right over here. He came to the approximate point and paused, listening intently. He heard no whispers now, but he did hear crickets and other insects, a night bird, occasional water dripping into shallow puddles, and trees rustling in the wind all around him. In the distance, the sound of an occasional erupting geysers hissed and sputtered. A chill ran up his spine. It was so dark that he could step on a leopard's tail without even knowing it until it was too late. Well, half expecting to feel talons at his throat, Clan held his hand to his neck and looked up at the churning clouds that clothed the starlight from his eyes. Summer lightning lit the sky and a bellow of thunder rattled the earth beneath his feet. The two assassins took advantage of this distraction and slipped out from under him, and they slithered around the back of a huge tree. Blending with the shadows of the clouds, they lightly scaled the impenetrable iron fence without notice as the thunder rolled away into the distance, leaving Clan alone at the forest's mercy. Clan, you see anything out there or not? Lake called nervously. As though he could now feel the difference of being left absolutely alone in the forest, Clan grew uneasy as if he sensed that dark things were creeping in on him from every direction. He turned and dashed up the slippery bank, high-stepping comically through the weeds. No, he said hastily, he answered, stumbling once and then again before reaching the gate. With great relief, he stepped back inside and locked the gate behind him. He flashed his beamer into the forest for one last check, and a score of shining eyes disappeared with a rustle of leaves. Lake held out Cran's tea for him as he stepped back inside the guardhouse, his face slightly pallid. You were right, Lake, Cran said. Must have been the wind. Well, let's have a Lambeau smoke, Lake said, handing him his pipe. Relax a while. I think you need it. You're right. I do. We've got uh, Westwatch the rest of the week anyway. Huh. Nothing ever happens up in Westwatch. Quan agreed. There's a lot of steps on a lot of stairwells to reach it. He took a seat and lit up his pipe, never knowing how close to death he had just been. Part five. A messenger came past the same guard station some time later that night with an urgent note. Top security, it read. Two skycrafts have been stolen at the inn, and Squire Axon Foster has been murdered. No suspects at the time. Urge caution and appropriate attentiveness. 
Report any unusual suspects or activity at once. Clan looked pale. I know Foster, he said. He was always patrolling the inn. You don't think? Lake shrugged, looking at his friend. I was watching the whole time, Clan. Nothing or no one came through that gate. Well, I know what you're going to say, Lake, but I think I better report what I did here tonight. Then he mumbled to himself, The Foolish Watchman. Part 6. After leaving the stupid, inept, blind guards at the gate, the two Bersin assassins had slithered secretively into town, up the main hill and into a narrow alleyway, laying up against the wall of the Hasbin Inn. There was enough loud music and singing and dancing inside to camouflage an entire battle. Although they moved with uneasy anxiousness, being heavily and illegally armed. So far, they had gone completely undetected through the center of the town. They were afraid that their luck would not hold out much longer, though, and secrecy was a hunting assassin's greatest asset. Lightning flashed. Thunder followed. A new wind tossed the trees. Rain was imminent. Key to a cave for a rock. Terzdaw mumbled a phrase he often mumbled. Key to a cave for a rock. Key to a cave for a stone. Habad repeated to him for the hundredth time. A stone, the Garnian said, not a rock. A rock is a stone. A stone, maybe a value, maybe hieroglyphic for collectors, doesn't matter. By the gods, that whiskey smells good, Terzda said, changing subjects rather than be scolded by the old one. Habad pointed a crooked finger toward the lot where the patrons of the has-been inn had anchored their skycrafts. Never you mind about that right now. I see two guards, one at either end, he said, his voice tapering off as the wind howled noisily over the rain vent on the corner of the building, spinning loose debris around their booted feet. Might have to kill them if we're ever going to get out of here unnoticed. One of the night guards, a burly retired admiral, was making rounds when he came down the platform outside the inn to the steps beside the alleyway and looked into the darkness toward the assassins. He wiped sweat from his face. It was hot and unbearably humid, even for a midsummer's night. He suddenly felt as though unfriendly eyes were focused upon him. And this thought made him shiver. Out of the corner of his eye, he thought he saw something cross the road toward the Skycraft lot, but when he turned to look, he saw only restless leaves and some papers being tossed about by the humid wind. A few drops of rain began to fall, dotting the porch and ground beyond with big dark spots. He squinted, but he saw nothing unusual. The other guard over at the Skycraft lot, Squire Axon Foster, nodded to him, and he casually waved back. He felt uneasy, but he didn't know why. Hesitantly, he moved on down the ramp stairs and headed to his next station as the rain began to fall in earnest. Turnstar rubbed his callous hands together and smiled. Might as well be blind, he said. He adjusted his huge battle axe in its hold on his back. I hope Gabriel gives me more sport than these oafs. <clears throat> Habad squatted, watching the lone guard near the back of the lot, less than 30 feet away. The dolt was biting his fingernails and paying no attention to his job. Habad took a Haas throwing knife from his belt and balanced it lovingly between his fingertips. He will, my stubborn apprentice, he will. If it's sport you want, you'll get plenty from the great Persian prince. 
He quickly stood, flicked his wrist in a fluid, graceful manner, then squatted again. I've seen him do mock battle in the Harvest Festival games at Din Diane. Good fighter. Very quick. Resourceful. Cunning. You'll see. Terzda peered over the wall with one big yellow eye and saw the guard futilely attempting to pull Habad's blade from his gushing throat. The man fell limply to the ground without muttering a sound and quivered for a moment before becoming still. Only then looked up into the stormy heavens and snorted, Mock battle? Whoa, where's the glory in that? Gabriel, wherever you are, he swore, spitting a glaring gaze. Terzda the Great is coming to show you the door of the dark valley. Prepare yourself for the sweet sleep of infinite death. Blinding lightning. Bellowing thunder. Come, Habad said. Let's get that damn key. The assassins hopped over the rickety fence. They watched the streets for a moment to make sure no one was watching. Then they backed two small one-man skycrafts into the woods behind some tenant cottages that bordered the Derugian livery apartments. Then, as silent as the sullen moon that peeped from behind a purple storm cloud, they shot out into the rainy heavens on a high slope toward Tungulin, the city of science and magic. That's the end of chapter two. Chapter three next, Tungulin, coming up next Sunday uh, for a million dollars.